welcome to International Programs Alumni Week. I am so thrilled that y'all are here to join us. My name is Hannah Meister. I work uh, in Tallahassee with the International Programs Office, and we're so excited to bring this Alumni Week to you for the first time. Really excited to celebrate international education, get to reflect on our own study abroad experiences, and celebrate the experience of students in the future getting to study abroad with Florida State. So that is my really brief general welcome. Again, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to our study center in Florence and the director, Frank Nero, is going to give us a welcome from Florence. Take it away, Frank. Well, it's so good to see everybody, a pretty big crowd. I wasn't expecting so many people. So it's nice to see you. We're um, here at the new FSU Florence Study Center. We're live, even though we're in a bit of a lockdown right now, but we were able to get our hands on some special passes. And since we're essential workers, we were able to come in today and present this lecture to our wonderful alumni. As you guys can imagine, this year has presented the FSU Florence program with probably one of its most difficult times in its 55 uh, year history. And that's why today is so special to us. But despite all of these ups and downs associated with the pandemic through the Herculean efforts of our associate director, who even during uh, last year when things were at its worst, were able to uh, bring the renovations to a finish here at the 16th century Bagnese Palace, to the teamwork and hard core efforts of our staff to prepare uh, throughout the summer and the early fall to try to get students here this spring. And we were successful in doing that. In fact, there's only about 200 or so American students in Florence this semester, where as many of you know, there's usually around 12,000 or so. Out of those 200 students, 43 are our young inspired uh, Knowles that despite everything we've been dealing with, um, still have that, um, that, we're so, that we're so proud of. Just wanted to let you guys know that we're in the old courtyard of the Bagnese Palace. And you can see that this is the space that has become our library. And it is the centerpiece of the study center. All of these columns you see made of Pieta Serena as well as these, as well as these arches and vaults are all original. At, in the 16th century, the roof was open to the sky, but we put in these wonderful skylights to make the space functional. And uh, it really is a dear, dear and lovely space that really promotes uh, studying while one is studying abroad. You can see we have this fantastic collection of books, around 18,000 of them that our students have to choose from. And we finally got an ideal location to, to place them in. So that's why today's lecture is so important to us because what we at FSU Florence seek to embody is our school's models that are associated with our famous torches. Virtus, artis, modus, strength, uh, character and skill. And it's these mottos, it's these virtues that have propped us up this semester, that have kept our backbones strong. And I'm so honored to introduce one of our faculty members, uh, Dr. Alan Pascuzzi, our students call him Dr. Alan. Uh, not only does he teach uh, the history of art for us, but he's also a world-renowned artist, painter, sculptor. And the special thing about Dr. Allen's classes is even if it's Art History 101 for our freshmen, uh, not only does he get them in the museum, but I think even more importantly, he runs the students through how works of art were made. 
So there's always a fresco workshop, a drawing workshop, a clay sculpture workshop. So the students understand how the Florentine artists actually use their intellect and hands to create the great Renaissance works that we so associate with the city of Florence. So without further ado, I'd like to present to everybody in our alumni lecture today, um, Dr. Allen, who's gonna run you through the project that we spearheaded together along with Tallahassee to make FSU's virtues, Viris Artes Mortes, Mortes, come to life in our study center. Alan, take it away, sir. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, as Frank was saying, uh, this is an honor to start off this uh, program, okay, uh, as uh, being the first speaker. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Pascuzzi. As Frank said, uh, a student just called me Dr. Allen. I'm from upstate New York. I've been, I've been in Florence for about 25 years or so, and I'm an art historian and an artist. So for me, these two things actually sort of uh, work together. Now, without further ado, let's just get right into the presentation. Let me share my screen. And let's get this going. <clears throat> one moment, just one moment, please. There we go. Okay, um, the title of the talk is The Personification of FSU Virtue, the creation and symbolism of the bronze sculptural group at the New Florence Study Center. Um, now, before I begin, I, I wanna give special thanks to a number of people. Um, number one to FSU for giving me this opportunity to, um, uh, to present this lecture. Um, also to the directors of FSU here in Florence, uh, Frank Nieru and, and Lucia Cossari, who has actually been just fantastic um, in creating one of the most amazing study centers that exists for any American school in, in Florence. Um, and also all the staff, the faculty, and also in, in particular, uh, Charles Panarello, who actually helped get all this together. That's why we're live from the Bagnese right here. So special thanks really go for these people that really make all this happen. They're behind the scenes, but definitely they are crucial to get everything going. Um, now, let me just start with a quote. Um, important works of art express universal ideas in their purest form. And what do I mean by that? If you look at artwork throughout history or something like the Statue of Liberty, uh, freedom, democracy, um, that my own grandparents saw when they came in um, uh, from Italy, um, these are sculptures that show hu hu the purest form of these ideals, universal ideals. If you wanna bring it into something like here in Italy, the David of Michelangelo, okay, the man is the measure of all things or this Renaissance sort of rebirth of art, okay, of classical thinking um, uh, reconciled with Christian thought. It's extremely important because okay, that's why these sculptures are extremely important. Now, when you look at a creation of a work of art um, and not to be too philosophical, um, it's not created by an artist alone. I'm speaking as an artist. It's usually through an alignment of an idea, an artistic vision, and external factors to really make it possible. It begins with the artistic vision of the patron and their need to express an idea. This idea is then elaborated by the artist and realized in the material. And it's also made possible by the historical moment in which it was created. And this is exactly what happened with the sculpture group that I'm gonna be describing in just a moment. Now, the sequence of the talk is gonna be as follows. I'm gonna give a brief introduction about the Commission for the Virtues uh, by going through a very brief history of female allegorical fi uh, uh, um, figures. The second section is gonna be the evolution of the idea and the symbolic meaning of these FSU allegorical figures. Then the third section is gonna be really the creation of the artes vitas modus, okay, how these were actually created. And then finally, the fourth section is casting the works in bronze, a brief history of bronze casting, which is extremely interesting, and then casting the virtues. And then I'll finish up with some final comments to sort of try and summarize everything that I've just said. Now, we're, we're here in Florence, which is one of the most beautiful cities, okay, on the planet, amongst other major uh, cities that are also beautiful as well. But uh, in particular, everyone is here really understands, and that's why the students that come here 
are, I know that are affected by the beauty of the city and its art, okay, language, culture. Um, and if you look at historically what happens, some of the most important works of Renaissance art were created specifically for the palaces of wealthy Florentine families. Art for the palace, extremely interesting since we're in one of these palaces right now, it was families like the Medici who commissioned paintings and sculptures like Donatello's Bronze David to adorn the courtyard that actually um, uh, uh, you saw just a moment ago of their palace to be seen and admired by all. Uh, this is uh, uh, Donatello's David, okay, that you can see uh, 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 the bronze work, which is extremely important because it was meant to be seen in the courtyard, which was a private sort of space, but could be seen from the outside. Now, why did these families do this? Why did they commission bronze works of art to put in their palaces? If you look at bronze sculpture, it's the highest art form to adorn one's palace. Why? It exemplified the sophistication of Greek bronze casting, okay, the highest form of art in certain cases, and also, the most importantly, the ideals of representing universal concepts, okay, ideals and also divinity in art. So these figures that were created for these families, for their palaces, really had a unique sort of niche in the history of art. Now, the Florida State University Palazzo Bagnesi, it, Palazzo Bagnesi is no exception. In fact, the Florida State University in Florence is continuing this centuries old tradition with the commissioning of three life-size bronze figures to adorn the interior of their newly uh, um, new study center, I should say, the Palazzo Bagnesi, which is in the heart of the city of Florence. And this is actually an image of this amazing palace that has just been redone and just opened uh, just recently. Now the commission for these works consisted of creating three female allegorical figures representing Florida State University's motto, artes vides modis, which could be, okay, you can uh, translate as creativity or skill, strength, and character. Now, what's interesting is that these female allegorical figures that were commissioned are related directly to Florida State University's early beginnings as an all-female school. So right from the very beginning, this commission, which is extremely interesting, um, was related to the core of the school, which is extremely important. Now, the initial request for the figures was for three female figures to represent the motto, okay, artes vides mores. The idea uh, was elaborated with, close, uh, with basically close collaboration of the directors, Frank Nero and Lucia Cossari. So it was without, without their initial idea, their initial sort of spark, this wouldn't, uh, project wouldn't have, have taken, uh, sort of taken flight. Now, the earliest idea, okay, was sort of based on the, um, the, the Florida State uh, emblem, those three torches, um, and the attributes were to represent FSU's motto, okay, the motto. Now, where do you start? As an artist, where do you start with a request like this, which is uh, a, a stimulating, but also poses a very difficult uh, sort of a problem, artistic problem. If you go back to ancient art, okay, especially these three graces that go way back to uh, this is in the Louvre, of these three females. In fact, this was sort of the initial idea, those three torches and the three females. And if you go to the history of it, and this is where it gets interesting, in ancient art, the daughters of Zeus, the Charites, uh, if, if I, my Greek is correct, uh, brightness, joyfulness, bloom, were these three female figures sort of embracing. So at left, we have this Greek sculpture. At right, we have the painting from Pompeii. So we have both the Greek and the Roman. And we have this ideas of these ideals that are personified as females. And if you even want to bring it, enlarge it a little bit, even in ancient Greece, the victory of, of Samothrace, so this amazing female figure with these wings, okay, that sort of shows victory, this flying victory, extremely important. And if you want to go even to Roman art, if you go to the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum, in one of the uh, reliefs underneath the, um, the arch, right behind Titus himself, there is this victory figure that's holding a wreath above his head, this victory, this, uh, uh, he's returning into Rome victorious, which is extremely important. So we have both the ancient Greece, okay, and ancient Greek and ancient Roman ideal of female figures for victory. What happens throughout time? These female sort of personifications of these ideals get transmuted into cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. Now, these are actually from Plato's Republic and also the Stoics actually use these as well. 
These were basic virtues that were required for a virtuous life. Now, right, the big sculpture we have of justice, okay, down below, the smaller image is actually from um, Pietro Lorenzetti's, the um, allegory of good government, these female figures. These female allegories figures also got transmuted into Christian ideals, okay, the cardinal virtues that were ad adopted by St. Thomas Aquinas, okay, the great Dominican theologian. The, he expanded them into these theological virtues of faith, hope, charity, and love. And these were qualities that were used to guide oneself in a morally good manner, okay, moral theology, so to speak, okay, the hope for salvation. And what I've just, just put on the side there is this one arch of a Arc of uh, St. Peter Martyr, okay, from Balduccio, Giovanni Balduccio, Milan of 1339, where we have these female figures of all these uh, theological virtues that are holding up, okay, this, um, this arch, this sarcophagus. Now, what also happens if we bring it into the university setting, okay, the female allegories are used for liberal arts. Now, we all know that there's the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric, the quadrivium, geometry, astronomy, arithmetic, arithmetic and music. These were abstract ideas personified as female figures. And what happens in art is that the posture, the gesture, the clothing, and even the attributes are used to show values and themes. Now, why were they used? Uh, why did, were female figures used? Because mainly the Latin words ended in A, the feminine, okay? And it stuck, okay, from there. Now, what I've done here, I've done a quick example not to go too much into art history, but we have this one amazing pulpit uh, by Giovanni Pisano. This is in Siena, the, the Duomo of Siena, in which right down below the central column of the pulpit is actually supported or, or decorated by these female allegories of the liberal arts. So throughout history, this is what, okay, I had to sort of deal with and, and look back to. Now, if you want to bring it into Florence, the most amazing sort of uh, concept of, of the three sort of female virtues are Botticelli's in Botticelli's painting of the spring, the three graces, voluptas, pleasure, chastity, and pulcritudo, beauty. And we have these amazing figures that write of these females um, that are sort of in these diaphanous dresses that are sort of dancing and holding each other's hands, okay, and the sort of hugging together, okay, and the circulating, circulating sort of concept of love of the whole, of the whole painting. Now, the idea then, okay, putting this all into perspective was how do you create, okay, new sculptures um, that sort of exemplify the motto of Florida State University and sort of still keep in, in tune with everything that's happened historically. And this is what happened. This is section two, the evolution of the idea. And you have to understand that when an artist is given an idea, Many people think that artists have their own ideas and they have to be left by themselves. No, in fact, artists work best when they have a good idea to work from. And if they're humble enough to say, wow, that's a great idea, I think I can even make it better visually. Now, these are the initial idea sketches. And I have to say that these are done with a big pen on the back side of actually one of my, one of my papers. When the, the inspiration, I know it sounds very sort of uh, trite, but when the inspiration hits, you've got to get it down. So at the left, you have this initial sort of idea of these three figures at right, okay, uh, they're a little more expanded. Again, they're mainly stick figures, but it's the, the nucleus of the idea. And it's from here that you begin to sort of evolve the idea. Now, the graces. It doesn't look like much, but the, the Botticelli's graces were sort of the inspiration to the concept of these three figures. Okay, even though it doesn't really look like a Botticelli, but trust me that, that uh, the idea was behind it. Um, then it, it was transmuted a little more, so I, I began to do a little, a little other sketches. Again, these are really quick, okay? It's sort of with the body gestures. You probably can't see, but the central figure has a harp. Uh, on the one on the left, you can actually hit, see there's a little bit of a book. So already the idea was forming, okay, of these attributes, okay? And from here, you go to the first small models. And this was my first sort of attempt at realizing it in three dimensions. So from the sketch, okay? to the first model. Well, these first models, and let me just, uh, I'll, I'll get them a little bigger here. Um, I actually had Artes in the center and then Vidas at left and Modus at right. In fact, the names are a little bit um, skewed a little bit. Artes, okay. Um, uh, it, these three figures were sort of on the, the guise of, of Botticelli. She's playing a harp, okay. Uh, at left, you have Vidas, who actually is sort of pointing to her book. And at right, you have Modus, who's sort of uncovering herself. In the beginning, I thought I was going to put like a diaphanous drape around them. That's why they were a little, they're, they're unclothed. Um, but when I showed them to the directors, and this is what I love this, uh, uh, the process, 
their first initial reaction was, well, it's just not quite. And um, I remember still the, the email saying that they wanted something in which the figures were a little bit more sort of together, maybe hugging, and also reflecting the three torches and the flames of the Florida State, Florida State University motto. And that's when, okay, that's sort of the input, okay, caused me to do the second version models. And these are the second version models, okay. Um, so if I can just go really quick from the first version to the second version, you can see a vast difference. Um, uh, the second version, let me get them a little bit quicker or a little bit bigger, I should say, where we have artists in the center was playing a harp underneath her foot. She has a, a, a Corinthian capital. There's a theater mask and there's also a painter's palette. So you have all the arts, okay? Theater arts, okay? music, art, architecture as well. At the left, you have uh, Vitas with her book, okay? Underneath her foot, there are actually other books as well. In fact, uh, they are, are gonna have other sort of titles put on there. And then at right, the initial idea for Mores was someone who was sort of um, uncovering herself. She's the only one with the cloak um, sort of uncovering. So when you get to these three figures, plus the clothes are the sort of like the grooves of the three torches. So artes, vides, mores. I went directly to the motto itself, trying to be as close as possible. So the three torches, the flames, the grooves. Okay. And again, these are only small models, about maybe eight inches high. Um, uh, I started to see, okay, the evolution of the idea. Now, these figures are just the beginning. This is just, okay, artes, vides, mores. Once you have these small models, then you have to go a little bit deeper. And if you look back at where we've come from, what I tried to do was combine the sort of like the Greek ideal with the Renaissance ideal with the modern ideal as well to put these things all together. Now, the evolution to the final idea, the third version of the virtues. And when you get to this point, you have to do larger models. Um, and so Artis was actually this, Artis was fully um, sort of, uh, how could you say, um, uh, a developed playing her harp, okay, with the attributes down below. In fact, I tried to get it so she's actually singing. So these actually have some sort of a, how do you say, a musical sort of connotation to them. Okay. Then you have Vides with the books, three books, okay, with the various titles we're going to put on, and she's the strongest of the uh, of the um, uh, of the group of uh, the Vides, meaning strength, okay, through learning. And then Mores, who's sort of uncovering her, you could say, her character, okay, sort of uh, uh, with through this artist and Vides, okay, these things that uh, sort of cause these sort of, you say, um, the flourishing of one's own character. Now, these figures um, are going to have Latin inscriptions. And this with the director, Frank Nito, and also by these inscriptions, these amazing inscriptions by um, uh, Dr. de Grummond, um, Artes, and I will go right into the, the, uh, the English, um, what are the inscriptions that are going to be associated with these? The arts are reborn. We are reborn in them. And that's for the central figure. For Vides, I sing of powers and books. And these inscriptions are, are absolutely uh, fantastic. And then Modes, I am traditions and times. Also in Florence, I am present. So put all these things together and the works are promising to be something extraordinary. Okay, so um, these are the three works. These are the, the gesso cast of them. And let me just um, stop share for one second. And I have a small version of this, okay? So I just stop share. And let me just uh, go through this. So this is just one of the models of, of Vitas. Okay, these are about maybe a foot and a half uh, tall. And it's at this point when you get to a model of this size, that you start to understand how the figure works um, from one aspect to, how could you say, the, um, the sketch to the smaller versions. Um, what happens is, um, is that the model sticks to take on a life of its own. Okay, so exactly what this figure shows, the drapery starts to become real drapery, the anatomy starts to become real, even the face okay, starts to take on a character of its own. Now there are other two, there are the two others, but we just brought this one down, which I think is just a, a good idea um, just to show the reality of it okay, as well. Let me go back and reshare everything. Okay. So um, we have the three models and 
one second, a moment. Got a bit of a glitch here. One moment. For some reason, Charles, I think. Yeah, it froze up a little bit. There we go. Okay, we're going. Okay, we're on. So the evolution of the idea of the final model. In fact, I, I wanted to put all these uh, up here. You have the um, initial sketch, the first set of models, second set of models, and then the third set of models. And then from here, you're ready to ex essentially progress to the actual works themselves. There's a lot of effort in order to get all these things sort of moving ahead. Now, the new version of the three graces, therefore, um, what's this a, uh, how could you say, a co combination uh, of? It's the motto itself with these female figures. And then this is what the, the product was. And from here, once it was essentially sort of a, a given the okay, then you go ahead. Now the commission itself, let me just uh, sort of make a comment on this. A commission of this uh, a sort is a rare opportunity um, to work on life-size bronzes, similar to the bronze works of the Renaissance is actually quite rare. And as an art historian and also as an artist, what happens is I was able to follow in the footsteps of these Renaissance masters. And I use the same process as the materials to create these works in pre preparation for the casting in bronze. Now I'm currently in the middle of the casting of them. And what I have is a number of the images in order to show you the complete uh, sort of process uh, from the models all the way up to, okay, at least some of the bronze pieces that have already been, uh, been cast. And this brings us to the third section, the creation of the large figures of artis vitis modis. Now, once you have the models, and it's interesting that even though you, you're working on the models, you're not really going into it 100%. Once you have the models, I don't know where you're going to go. This is when the real work starts. And what uh, had to happen was you have to get all of the anatomy down. So the first sort of campaign was to do very close um, uh, figure studies from life. I do them in, in uh, red chalk, like a Michelangelo, okay, Michelangelo used, in order to understand the anatomy of the figures. Now these are sculpture uh, drawings for sculptures. So you have to understand every single um, uh, viewpoint. Um, so you're going front and back, okay, side view, three quarter view. And this is what has to happen in order to do sculptures that are harmonious. And I think this is actually the, the, um, the secret of some of the Greeks as well, okay? The um, absolute dedication to um, anatomy and also proportion. Now this brings you to measuring. And when you're doing three different figures, um, the problem is you don't want one figure to get too big or another figure to get too small. Your measurements have to be exact. So every aspect of all these figures were measured from the figure itself, okay? The width, okay, everything um, of the limbs of the body itself even to the gestures of the legs, okay? Where does the patellus uh, uh, sit, okay? How do the, um, the rectus femoris, how do all these muscles interplay with each other? But then you also have to study the gestures. You have to get the delicate aspects out as well. The figures had to be harmonious, um, not just sort of based on anatomy. So all of the gestures of the hands, even restudying the pinky finger to give that extra little sort of, um, uh, how can you say it, uh, 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 detail to make it come alive. And also the feet from the feet and the toes, even the toenails in certain cases, all had to be studied. And everything had to be measured, even the width of the fingernails and the width of the toenails. Um, everything had to be proportionate. Okay? That's why this commission for me was an extremely important sort of opportunity because in, uh, these are so important, everything could not, uh, had to be measured. You can't leave anything to chance. Now, the model. If we go back to Giorgio Vasari, the first art historian, what does he say? He says, sculptors are accustomed to make what is called a model for the works in clay or wax or plaster. And that's exactly what I did. Now, because they can exhibit in it the attitude and proportion of the figure that they wish to make, endeavoring to adapt themselves to the height and breadth of their statue. And that's exactly what I did. So I was following this Renaissance ideal, okay, of measuring everything, getting it perfect in order to progress to the large figure. Okay, now how do you actually do the large figure? And this is the armature for the large works. The armature consists of essentially um, an iron core, and basically sort of like a stick figure, but in an iron, uh, following your drawing. So everything is, is always measured, so you know where your measure, measurements are going. And then from here, once you get the attitude exactly what you want, okay, 
you begin to build it up. I like to use wood just because it's natural, especially with the clay that I use, um, try, trying to be as uh, authentic and Renaissance as possible. So you build it up with uh, the wood. I actually use plastic ties, so it may be a little bit of a, okay, I have to admit that, okay. Um, the sculpting of the large figure is important because you have to maintain the idea of the initial model. So the bones of the figure are made and placed in the necessary pose after the pattern of the small model. And this is the stress that occurs. Um, you can deviate, you can evolve, but in essence, that initial idea, okay, has to remain the same. And that's the trick is to maintain that sa the same feeling of the early models into the large works, which sometimes is not the easiest thing to do. Now from here, what happens? You have your initial sort of iron sort of armature, you build it up with the wood, and you begin to build on the clay. And the clay that I use is actually from Impronetha. It's a uh, fantastic clay, very, very compact, works really well. From here, you begin to build it up. You get the anatomy on, and there's about 150 to 200 pounds of clay on this figure. So you begin to build up the anatomy very carefully. Um, and this is just another view of it. Okay, leaving the head, hands, and feet uh, uh, away uh, uh, apart. You're gonna be doing those uh, afterwards. And then this is about a week and a half to two weeks of work, getting all the anatomy down, making sure it's perfect. And again, always referring back to your drawings, okay, making sure that everything is, okay, looking at it is, uh, has the same feeling, have the same uh, proportions as that original um, study, study drawing. And then even the backside has to be done correctly because these are figures to be seen in the round. And I sort of looked to the Greek ideal of working more on the front, on the back than on the front because that's where the details are really sort of the most important, okay? The side that sometimes isn't seen by everyone. And then again, you always go back to all the muscles, okay? The scapula, the, um, the, the different sort of uh, details of the, uh, of the anatomy in the figure and transmute them into or transport them or uh, put them into your sculpture as well. Now the heads. This is a whole other topic in itself, but the heads have to be done separately. You can't, you can't work on it when it's on top of the figure. So these are the two of the heads. Artes is at left and uh, uh, Mores is on the right. And when you're working on the heads, these are when, this is when the figures actually come alive. You're working usually in a darkened sort of studio um, with the light directly on it, okay, trying to bring out, okay, all the nuances of the figure, making sure it's perfectly symmetrical with these flames that are coming out of the uh, top of the head, okay? And this is actually Vides, okay, working on the hair, making sure the hair is supple, has to fall naturally. And then these eventually are added onto uh, the figure um, itself. And it's the faces that add life to the figures in certain cases. So the feet, um, these are some of the details in the feet with all the toes, okay. Um, um, the cuticles even, I put the cuticles on just like the Greeks then, okay, because cuticles um, really show um, uh, the true mastery as far as I'm can, can uh, concerned. And these always go back to your, your initial studies, okay, studying from, okay, life and then executing them exactly the way, okay, you study them as well. So when you get everything done, this is the complete figure, it was hot in the studios, and that's why you see those little patches because the clay was actually breaking, uh, cracking a little bit. You have the complete figure, it's, it's completely in the nude. Now you have to dress it and you have to drape it, okay, with real folds. And this is when I actually went back to some of the Renaissance ideals. Now, what do the what do they do in the Renaissance? In the Renaissance, they actually use cloth that was uh, sort of a, a, a covered with clay, and they dressed their figure. And that's exactly how I did these figures as well. Um, essentially, you take like a muslin type of cloth, you cover it with clay, sort of like a wet type of clay, and you literally have to dress the figure. The folds have to be accurate. You have to show the body from underneath, but then you have to sort of accentuate it. And these folds were particularly important because these folds were the grooves of the three of the three torches. So what I was trying to do consciously was as I was putting the, the drapery on, was create these folds in order to recreate these, uh, these torches. And that's why the idea of these torches of the figures were absolutely brilliant. It poses a challenge, but that's when things really come out. Okay, so the bottom was done and then the top, okay, sort of dress them. So the anatomy is underneath uh, uh, and the draper is on top, just like a real figure. And even the backside, this is actually one of the ties, okay, that are actually keeping the, um, uh, the, 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 the cloak on, okay, again, you have to be just as careful in the backside they do in the front side. And then the attributes, in this case for Vitas, there was the books, the feet have to be resting on it, and you have to make it seem like it's real, and this is where your measurements uh, come in uh, uh, from the very, from the very beginning. 
And then we can go through all the figures. This is Artis, okay, uh, sort of the quick rundown. Artis that left completely done uh, in the center with the bottom, okay, part uh, 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 dressed, and then at right with the top part, okay, uh, as well. Uh, I ended up actually redoing the face of Artis, uh, sort of redoing it. I was working in my studio uh, uh, under lockdown, so I didn't have enough uh, sort of time to, to get the face done, but I uh, redid it uh, later on. Uh, and then for uh, Modes, let me just give you a quick rundown as well. We have the uh, armature with the wood, the clay, the building up of the anatomy, okay? The finishing of the anatomy, and then the head, hands put on with the feet, and then, from there, the dressing of it down below with a long cloak and then up top, keeping those grooves in order to show like it's um, the three, uh, one of the three torches um, uh, uh, as well. Now, from here, when you, when you are going to do a bronze figure, um, you have to start to think about the casting process. And what the first thing you have to do, to do is you have to make a negative of the large figure, which is not the easiest thing. If it's a small figure, it's a little bit more, uh, a little easier. But with larger figures, you have to think about okay, making a negative cast of it. Now, how do you do this? Uh, now, there are many sort of uh, different sort of, uh, how can you say, techniques. But in this case, you have to use silicone. Silicone is basically a rubber uh, type of thing that goes on uh, liquid and then hardens. And in this case, the image you're seeing is that a, a complete sort of silicone layer on top, which covers all of the figure, gets, goes into all of the nooks and crannies. And then from there, you put a second layer of silicone on it, which is in paste, which is a yellow sort of silicone, um, which then hardens into a harder sort of gum layer. But again, this isn't enough to make a negative cast. You have to put sort of like a hardened shell on top of it in order to give form to sort of backing to this uh, gum layers. And then from here, you complete the figure in this uh, gum layer, which gets it ready for these uh, uh, external shells. And then, I don't know if you can see it, but the figure down below is starting with the shell. You have to do it in sections. And the next image, you'll probably have a better idea. Um, these are sort of like an egg shell, okay? And the exterior part, you do them in sections. This is the top part of one of the figures. Bottom part of the legs done in three of the bases. And just to give you an idea of what happens when you when you take off these shells and then begin to take off the silicone, this is what happens. Um, the initial figure in clay is no longer necessary. You have your negative cast of it, okay, done perfectly with these silicone layers. In fact, when you take it off, this is what you get. This is the upper half of Artes. You have the complete figure in negative, and that's extremely important. Right now, your figure is now sort of immortalized. Uh, just from the clay is not enough. Now you have the negative cast of it. Now you can proceed and start to make essentially the wax positive okay, for the bronze casting. Now this brings me to section four, the casting of the works in bronze. And let me just go through a really brief history of bronze casting because I think it, it actually adds to the, the whole sort of um, uh, interpretation of the work. Um, as we know, bronze is an alloy of, of copper and tin. And what we see on top, the, the image on top are actually these copper and tin uh, ignits that were actually found off the coast of the UK in 2009. And they actually go back to about 900 BC. So bronze casting has been around for, for centuries, you get the Bronze Age. These are combined by melting them at about 1300 degrees Celsius. That's about 2000 degrees, okay? Um, and what happens is when you, when you combine these two elements together, okay, these two metals together, down below the uh, images uh, of the bronze bars. And this is what happens when you bring them into the bronze foundry, okay? You have these bronze bars that are gonna be used in order to cast figures in bronze. Now, what is, okay, a bronze sculpture? Bronze sculpture essentially consists of a thin shell of metal representing the exact form of an original work that's usually in clay, just sort of what I just showed you. To create a bronze sculpture, okay, you basically have to pour molten bronze into a negative mold, as you see on the, on the side here. Now, it sounds a lot easier than, 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 uh, um, than you can say it, um, than you can actually do it, I should say. And if you go back to history, and I'll do this very quickly, um, early bronze casting was, was solid. You know, the earliest examples we have of bronze castings were actually solid works. Now, what does this mean? That they did a complete figure, usually in clay, did a negative cast of it, okay? And then essentially, uh, put the negative together and then just poured in the molten bronze. So the figure at right was actually these early figures uh, 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 of the Greek era. Um, these were essentially solid 
figures. And they were very small. You couldn't do large figures. Now, ironically, um, uh, it wasn't only in Greece. Uh, they were doing bronze casting in Africa. They were doing it in China as, as well. As well. And it, the, the, this type of casting, a solid casting, was actually first perfected in present-day Pakistan, according to some of the historians as well. And in the early part of the Greek uh, sort of history of bronze casting, a lot of the figures were like this, and they were actually very small. But then it begins to evolve. And this is where we get into the lost wax method. In around the sixth century BC, what happens is a revolution of casting um, with the introduction of a core um, uh, with a bronze skin on top, which essentially produced hollow works. Now, what do I mean by that? You essentially create a hollow core, and I'll illustrate just in just a second, of usually terracotta or, or clay. This was created, okay, sort of like a skinny mannequin, and then covered over with wax, about one centimeter thick, about the, the width of a, a, a finger. Um, this was then completely worked on, finished up. Then it was covered with a fireproof core, or I should say material, usually a, a plaster of Paris and, and, uh, and earth, heated, the wax melted out, and this left a hollow space that was then replaced with molten bronze. Now, um, at right, we have this figure of Zeus, okay, uh, this Greek figure, but um, which is one of the best examples of this. Let me just show you what, what I mean. And this is a, a, very, um, a very effective sort of um, uh, example. So in upper left, we have this uh, initial core, usually done of um, sort of terracotta or clay. That's covered with wax, usually beeswax, okay? Finished perfectly, that's right in the center. Off to the right, it's covered in this fireproof sort of material, usually sort of plaster of Paris and earth. Then that's heated, if you go to the lower left, the wax runs out, and then the one in the center at the, at the, in the lower part, okay, it's filled in with molten bronze. That core, I should say, that envelope is then broken, and voila, you've got your, your bronze figure, and you begin to um, sort of to, to, to finish it up, okay, in other words, to chase it and polish it up. Now, there was another, um, and I don't get too deeply into, into this, there was another technique, which was called basically um, a second method in which the, this happened in the third century BC, where the original figure, they took negative casts of it, okay, and then reassembled the casts, and then did your negative uh, uh, wax positive from it. And that allowed you to get sort of copies of the same work. And this process was used by the Greeks and the Etruscans and even the, and the Romans as well. Um, but essentially it's that lost wax method, heating the wax inside this, um, this core type of thing, letting it flow out and replacing it with bronze. Now, what's interesting is that when you think about bronze casting, what did it look like in, in this time period? Okay, and it really hasn't changed over the centuries. This is a uh, called the Berlin Foundry Cup, this Kelix from the fifth century BC. And this shows us what it looked like inside a bronze uh, foundry of this, of this time period. And let me just, this is too interesting to pass up. If you look at this, the underside of the cup, okay, at left, you see this big tube type thing, which is actually the, the foundry, and those were the heating of the bronze. And then uh, there's workers, there's hammers. Okay, on the right-hand side, you can actually see someone who's hammering some of the arms onto another work. So they're attaching. Remember, there's no soldering at this time period um, uh, as well. Now, that sort of bronze cup shows how amazing works of bronze uh, were done. Okay, like the, the Riachi bronzes that were found off the coast of Reggio Calabria in 1972. Some of the most exquisite works of, uh, of bronze casting that exist that we know of, and there must have been hundreds of thousands of these done in ancient Greece. And if I can do a parenthetical discourse, and I found this even in bronze casting today, for the ancient Greeks, um, the concept of the artist and the, the idea and, and, and a, a sort of a creating the idea was important, but the most important concept was making something well made. In other words, remember there were no artists in ancient Greece, they called them technites, okay, technites, so to speak. And the best sort of compliment you could say to someone who's doing works like this was, wow, what a great, you know, it wasn't like, wasn't a great idea. It was, wow, that's well made. And if you look at the face of one of the Riachi bronzes with the curls, um, the copper lips, okay, the inlaid eyes, uh, you can see that they uh, sort of relished in the fact of making these things okay, to their utmost ability, and that still exists today. Now, if you look at the history very quickly, and I'll go through this quickly, uh, the Etruscans were expert bronze casting. I have uh, friends who are bronze casters that looked at this chimera in the archaeological museum, and they saying, how did they do this okay, so long ago? The bronze is extremely thin and fine. You could even go to the Arringatore in Florence as well in the Archaeological Museum. The Romans, also brilliant uh, technique as well. 
But what happened, and this is crazy to think about it, that the Greek and Roman bronze casting techniques were almost completely lost in the Middle Ages and essentially reduced to simple casting methods, essentially bell casting, okay? It was revived, however, in the Renaissance. And in certain cases, people like, okay, artists like Ghiberti, okay, and his bronze doors, the gates of paradise for the baptistry, um, revive this art form, okay, doing these exquisite works of art. Remember, he does, he works 25 years on one set of doors and then another 25 years on another set of doors, okay, creating the gates of paradise that Michelangelo says, okay, they're worthy of the gates of paradise. And then you have Donatello's David, which is the first to use that system of making casts and reassembling, okay, uh, the figure, okay, this Donatello's David is one of the most important figures in early Renaissance sculpture. And then you have Cellini's Perseus right in Piazza Signoria, okay, this interesting sort of figure with the um, severed head of Medusa. And there's a wonderful story of the, of the casting of the Medusa, uh, excuse me, of the Perseus as well. And then finally, John Bologna's Mercury, okay, one of the most reproduced figures in the history of art, even in Rochester, New York, where I'm from, this is on the tallest building in the city as well. He's the FTP florist guy, okay? <laughs> Essentially, um, you have this ep epitome of, of, how can you just say, a pure form, okay, uh, Mercury, okay, pointing to where the inspiration for all of this comes from, from the gods typically. Now, all of them used the same system that I actually used um, uh, for these figures. And we have to get into the preparation for casting in bronze, and that's the wax copy. So we've done our figure, We've done our casting, uh, so get the, I said the negative cast. Let's go into the actual preparation for the casting in bronze. Now remember, you get your wax copy from the silicone and the counterform used to, uh, that I discussed before. Um, the wax is brushed into this negative cast, left to cool, and voila, you've got your positive wax copy that's produced. And what does that entail? It's something like this. The wax cools, forms that positive cast, and this is the exact replica of your original work. Um, this wax copy is then refined and retouched in red jeweler's wax, which actually melts a little easier in your hands. And it's easier to touch up figures in wax than it is in bronze. It's a lot softer. So wherever you see on the figures that I'm going to show you where there's red, those are touch-ups that I had to do in order to prepare these figures for the casting in bronze. This is the head of Artes, the one that I actually uh, decided to redo. These are the of uh, legs of Mores. In fact, you can see in the background the various sections of the figures that were cut up, okay? And this is just another view of the figure. So it's the exact copy of your original clay. And then this is uh, Vitas uh, with the books underneath and these had to be touched up, okay? You can even see some of the, the beeswax up on top. And then this is the full figure of Artis. Okay, I had to touch up a lot of things of the eyes, okay, even the cloak as well with that red wax. And it takes a, 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 a a bit of time to, to do something like this. Um, just at the close up. And then this is Mores, okay, with the head that I actually um, sort of uh, reattached, or excuse me, Vidas that I reattached uh, as well with the flame. And when I say that you get the exact copy of the um, uh, uh, of the clay original, it's exactly what that is. So at left, you have the um, original clay figure. At right, you have the wax copy of it, okay? And all of these will also have crowns on. So this was a test of the crowns that are gonna be put on top of the um, uh, figures as well. The crowns actually are sort of a, a, re, uh, a reconstruction a little bit of the, the, tor the, the torches as well. So those three um, sort of half circles on top are also uh, uh, sort of recall the three torches um, as well. Now, what do you use? I just wanted to show this uh, as I was working one day, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to show the tools that you actually use? These are the tools. You have wax all over you, okay? There's the wax burning um, here and there as you're touching these things up and you're working very closely on these things. And you have to always keep in mind that what you see in wax is what's going to be in bronze. So you have to make sure that everything is completely smooth, uh, completely sort of worked out to its, um, to its final sort of, how can you say it, the, your final sort of version. And this is um, Amores, the figure, and after being touched up with some of the little red touches here and there. And then even the, the details. So there's the foot of uh, Artes, uh, the harp, uh, some of the hands, all of these had to be touched up. So it's an amazing process and you have to get into every aspect of it. You can leave nothing to chance, okay? Working on every um, uh, thing that, uh, uh, well, that, you, that needs to be sort of redone, okay? And then from here, 
and this is we're getting into the sort of the final sort of a, a home stretch. Um, once you have the complete wax uh, figure, you then have to prepare it for the actual casting in bronze. Okay, and this is the, the one of the last steps in order to, to get the bronze casting. What you have to do is you have to make rods of wax and you have to apply them to the wax copy in a network to cover the entire surface of the figure. Now, when the wax copy is covered with the fire resistant material and heated, the wax rods will melt as well and create hollow tubes for the distribution of the molten bronze to reach the entire area of the sculpture and also to allow air to flow out, which is extremely important because if air doesn't flow, things begin to explode. Now, each rod touching the surface of the sculpture covers about 10 square centimeters of the surface. So you have to be very careful, okay, about where these things are touching so they don't overlap too much, but also that they cover the entire figure. So essentially, in some of the images that I'm gonna be showing you, okay, the whole figure is in sort of this sort of cage in certain cases, and where it touches, that's where the bronze is going to flow out, okay? Now, these wax rods also have to converge at the top where the molten bronze is gonna be poured in. It essentially flows down this network of tubes to replace the space left by that wax that had been melted out. So the trick is, is to make them all converge so that when the bronze begins to flow down, it all begins to fill up. And so these are just other images of the whole figure just being sort of like covered up with these tubes, okay? And then the next step, this figure is then covered up entirely with this fire resistant envelope, which is in essence, plaster of Paris and uh, of red earth. And this is going to be resistant to the, hot, the heat of the bronze, okay? From there, okay, you could even see you have to put the various sort of uh, uh, air vents, okay, in the holes okay, on top. And then you get ready for the casting in bronze, okay? And what does this entail? The wax copy is complete with the runners. Okay, it's put in this cylinder of these, uh, uh, this fire resistant sort of um, uh, material and you have to melt out the wax. This gets put at right in this furnace and it gets melted out for about 10 days. It has to be very even, very slow. So the wax sort of melts out very carefully. Okay, 10 days to make sure that is completely out. From there, this cylinder, as we can call it, is then put in a pit at left, okay, covered with earth around it and then prepared for the molten bronze to go in it. And you can even see at right, okay, that hole where the molten bronze is gonna be poured in. So these are the cylinders in the pit ready for the casting. Now let's talk about the bronze itself. The bronze is in these bars. It's put in the furnace and heated. Now what's interesting, and if I can go back to that, that uh, a Greek uh, Berlin cup that I showed you, in certain cases, things really haven't changed. The uh, image at left is actually of the furnace that I used to make these figures. At right is the furnace on this uh, uh, cup. And really it's actually almost the same, the same thing. In fact, what I found is that when it begins to be heated, okay, it corresponded perfectly to this cup of the fifth century BC with one of the workers that were actually um, stoking it from, from down below. And that's exactly what happened. It's heated up, okay, and the bronze starts to get put in and become molten. And the workers, in order to get everything ready, you have the main sort of furnace heating up the bronze, and then you have a smaller crucible. Even the crucible has to be heated up at around 1300 degrees Celsius because it can't be colder than the bronze because if heated bronze hits into this cru crucible, it's going to explode as well. So you have to heat that up. Okay, so at left is the unheated crucible, at right is when they're heating it up. And then you have essentially the bronze heated in the furnace. And this is one of the workers that are um, sort of uh, stoking the, the bronze, getting it fluid, making sure it's ready. When it's ready, when it's fluid, when it's liquid, okay? And I call it the Vulcan's Forge, the, the bronze is molten. This is when the most crucial part of the whole casting process begins and also the most dangerous. You put your crucible underneath and you begin to pour in the liquid bronze into your crucible. And what's interesting is that this process has been going on for centuries and that glow, that orange glow, um, is fascinating because it's, uh, uh, it's centuries old, okay? Some of the same type of concept of melting this bronze. Now, once you have the bronze in the crucible, then you begin to pour into the mold. And this is the pouring of one of the figures. All the, um, uh, the bronze uh, workers are uh, covered up so they don't get splashed because bronze spatters liquid, but it actually, when it falls to the ground, it's actually 
a, 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 a solid, okay? And this is just a, a larger image of it going into the hole. You have to be very careful not to spatter too much. And then this is when you're almost done. When the bronze begins to come out again, that means that you've, you've covered up the figure. Okay, the hot air is also coming out as well. And then what happens? You have to wait about 12 hours and it's still within that big, huge cylinder. You pull the cylinder out of the pit and break it. And when you break it at right, this is what you have. You have all those tubes of wax, which were then melted out, are now bronze. And you have the figure, if it's correctly done, that's completely replaced with the bronze, the molten bronze. And this is essentially the figure of Artes, the front and the back with this sort of tube, okay, this network of tubes that are now bronze. These have to be cut off. Let me just go ahead, okay? And if you remember that all these tubes had to be going uh, all the way around the figure. So that's the wax sort of network of tubes that I showed you before. And this is what happens. This is the aftermath. After you pour the bronze and you break away that fire resistant envelope. And then from here, this is when the work really starts. You begin to cut away all those tubes. At left, that's Artis. At right, one of the figures. Uh, in fact, the, the legs, I should say. And then the chasing. And this happens uh, basically with various power tools before it was done by hand. And from what is actually done right now, this is what I can show you. Okay, unfortunately, the figures aren't completely sort of assembled. But you have the two figures, Vetus and Modus. These are the figures in bronze that have just been they've cut away the tubes, okay? And we're um, in the process of uh, chasing them up, of actually sort of a, um, a polishing them up, okay? This is the figure of Vitas with the flames that have been soldered on. And then Mores, a little bit closer. Those holes are actually um, uh, when some of the uh, uh, other uh, metals that were used to fix the, the fire resistant core, you have to get out all the, those little nail type of things and it's gonna replace with bronze. And the thickness of the bronze is, I took a picture of this in the interior part. It's about one finger's breadth, okay? So this was clay, or excuse me, was wax. Now it's actually bronze. And then all the other pieces. This is a bucket of arms, okay? Uh, we have um, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the harp on top, and then we have the theater mask. This is for Artis. And then just a sequence very quickly the clay of Avidas, the wax copy, and then in bronze. So you're dealing with clay, wax, bronze, the bronze is the final sort of destination. And then the same with Mores, clay, wax, bronze. Okay, this process, ancient process. And then I put this in just because I thought it, it was extremely interesting from the idea to the bronze itself. So from the initial idea sketch, um, based on the directors, Frank and Lucia's ideas of, of these figures as torches, to the initial idea of these figures as well, to the second, to the third, and then to the final, the wax, the bronze, okay, all these work together to create this, these, these figures. And let's just find, uh, sort of summarize everything in the, in the final comments. Now, the figures have yet to be assembled, and they're going to be placed in the palace, okay, soon. Um, as I showed you, the casting process is extremely involved. It's highly technical in certain cases. And I have to say that the artist, okay, has to rely on skilled technicians, okay? Uh, but you also have to control the work as it's progressing. What's interesting about this project and, and the commission and also being in this palace or where the figures are going to go is that it's a collaboration between the cre creativity of the artist and the technical skills of the artisans. Now, ironically, sometimes it's the artisans who are lost, their names are lost to time, but they're the ones who are extremely important in realizing all of this because this process in which the bronze work are conceived with inspiration, so to speak, and then born with fire, um, they're finished with a dedication to craftsmanship by the artist and the artisans as well. So the FSU allegorical figures, okay, um, not only revive this ancient use of female allegorical figures, okay, to represent these universal ideas, but also the tradition of adorning the interior of palaces with art. Now, what's unique about this is that um, it revives this Florentine phenomenon of this appreciation for bronze sculptures, this desire for beauty, and the uniting of craftsmanship and creativity of artists okay, and artisans. And the bronze virtues, again, if I can finish up for FSU, um, it really relates to the commitment of the universities to their own motto, artes, vides, modes, specifically in this time period, specifically for the students that are here, it combines this dedication to the traditional artistic skills, the technical knowledge of, of Florentine craftsmen, 
And it's really combining to produce three, three truly unique sculptures, not because I've done them, but because I was given the opportunity to do this that will adorn not only this new amazing center, okay, the FSU study center, but also the, you could say the eternally beautiful city of Florence. Thank you for your appreciation, uh, your, your coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Okay, it's my pleasure. Let me unshare, right? Okay. Excellent. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, let me get this unshare for one second. For some reason, Charles. Okay, is it going up there? Oh, there it is. I can't see it for some reason. Pardon. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, I will seed. Great. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Can Can everyone still? Are we all connected yeah. still? Yes, we are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All righty. Okay, now, um, should I leave this to, to, is there someone else who was supposed to speak for just a moment? Okay. Yeah, for just a minute. Um, so you can hold tight. Um, we will have an opportunity for some Q&A in just a minute. Um, but first, we do have some comments and some thoughts from our associate director here in Tallahassee. So Lou Blenman is going to take over for just a few moments. Um, Lou, I made you a co-host. You should be able to unmute and start your video and I can share your slides for you. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, it's not often that I'm at a loss for words, but I, I, it's a good thing I wrote a few notes down because otherwise I think I would just waffle on here. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is introduce myself. I'm Louisa Blenman. I'm the Associate Director here in Tallahassee. Um, I work alongside Hannah and, and our whole uh, team um, here and do our best to support our colleagues uh, abroad. Um, I want to thank Hannah and her team for putting this together. This is our first um, episode in our first Alumni Week, so this was a big day for us, and it's entirely appropriate that uh, that it was with with Florence and and uh, with Alan, who I want to thank for uh, his talent and his tangible work of art as well as his teaching. Um, I personally can't draw a straight line, so I'm in awe of his ability to uh, to to do all of this. Um, and I thought I was really going to struggle uh, how to say thank you to him, but as any good teacher does, uh, he gave me the understanding to say that, Alan, your work is indeed well made, so thank you. Uh, I also want to uh, quickly thank Frank and his whole uh, staff over in Florence. This uh, has arguably been the hardest year uh, in, in uh at least since the early 60s, mid 60s, but uh, certainly for, for those uh, colleagues abroad, uh, the hardest year of their lives probably. Um, and uh, I can't wait, as I know many of you uh, feel the same way for us to be able to gather in the palace and fully experience our new home there that Lucia and Frank and so many others uh, work so hard to make a reality um, and see Alan's work in the flesh. Um, I also want to thank our current students who are in Florence, um, who have shown so much strength, skill, and character. Uh, I'm so proud of them for their determination and their resourcefulness and uh, finding uh, the best of Florence, even in the midst of a pandemic. Um, of course, there are many parallels to the strength, skill, and character that they have displayed to that of our beloved mud angels. I see many uh, of your faces here. So thank you for, for joining us and for setting the bar so high for uh, all the generations to come after you. And I also wanna thank our campus partners. Um, in in a, a very interesting way, uh, the, the pandemic has provided us with some opportunities uh, that, that I, I think we probably would have struggled to, to get to um, without the, the catalyst of, of the pandemic. So we've, we've had fantastic uh, campus partners. Uh, the first of which that I'd like to highlight here is with the Career Center 
We've worked very closely with them. Um, they have, have uh, appointed a, a person uh, on their staff, Lee Pond, who um, is our, our uh, key uh, ally or relation in the Career Center. And we are doing some great things together to help our students uh, make the most of their, um, their time. Uh, once they come back, how do they present themselves and their experiences? But we've also worked with them. Um, I say worked with them. They've done the work and helped us uh, uh, along the way to um, identify and create a new international programs designation within the pro professional mentor program. So this is actually, I think, a really uh, creative and interesting way for uh, those of you who studied abroad but want to, to be able to give back um, to our students. Um, it's one of, one of the ways that, that we are able to do that. Um, you can sign up and, and uh, designate that you did study abroad and hopefully then you could, could work to mentor, and this is all remote, um, but to, to mentor uh, one of our FSU students or, or more than that, if you wish, um, on how to um, you know, approach their careers and their graduate school lives and how to build on, on everything that they've learned at FSU and abroad. So that's a, 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 an interesting uh, way for you to get involved if you wish, that's kind of a dip your toe in. It, it's, it's uh, I think um, you can be as involved or, or removed as, as you wish. Um, the second uh, partnership that um, we've, we've developed, um, we've, I think we've always been pretty, pretty good with social media, but we've uh, found that our social media people across campus are working more closely together to help uh, promote our, what we as FSU have to offer. Um, our social media team does a great job of, um, of helping uh, the community understand what amazing things our colleagues abroad are doing, um, helping our alums share their memories and reconnect with one another, um, we're on a lot of platforms. Um, we've got Facebook for those of us who uh, are, are in that, um, that generational target. And then we have other, other um, platforms like uh, Instagram and Snapchat. And I'm sure that Twitter, they're, they're all over the place. Um, I'm old enough that Facebook is kind of my comfort zone. So if you uh, have not checked out some of those um, Facebook groups, it's a, a really fun way to reconnect with folks. In fact, last, just last week, I reconnected with uh, 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 my, one of my roommates from when I studied abroad. We had both been on the London page and she texted me or messaged me through Facebook and said, hey, I'm in Tallahassee for a soccer tournament. Are, do your kids play soccer? And we ended up meeting out at the FSU uh, RecFlex uh, for the first time in probably, I don't know, 25 years, 30 years, something like that. So that social media did, provided that for us. Um, and then the, the next uh, one that I want to touch on is that we've We've worked more closely, I think, with the Alumni Association and with our, um, our colleagues to try and develop opportunities for us to stay in touch with you and to help you feel connected so that I know a lot of us want to be able to give back and share our time and talents. Um, many of you may have connections abroad where you could help us develop internship uh, relationships. I know lots of folks have um, either work for multinational businesses or have their own businesses or have contacts abroad. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really exciting is we've, we've tried over the last few years to bring uh, or to encourage alumni to let us know when they're going to be in a study center location. And, and we'll bring uh, folks in to do guest lectures or a panel discussion or just to have a tour that maybe a student might lead so that they can connect with this generation of study abroad students um, and, and learn from, uh, and our students can, can learn from you who've built on your own experience. And then finally, I wanna um, highlight and thank our relationship with uh, the FSU Foundation. Um, you know, we've, 
we've talked and 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 dabbled around for years in working with the the, the foundation. And we uh, just in the last couple of years have been really fortunate to to really develop some some great uh, relationships. I, I saw, I think, four of our colleagues on this call, Sarishni and Mafe and Marissa and Ashley, some of those names may ring, ring a bell for, for many of you, but they have certainly helped us um, with our efforts like the Great Give, which we did a few weeks ago. I know many of you were involved with that. Um, the, the pandemic, of course, has been very challenging for international programs um, and the whole university and our students. Um, but it, it's been it's been tough times for us financially and, and it probably will be um, at least I would guess for another year and a half or so, maybe two years. And so our work with the foundation uh, folks has been very important for us to, to um, bridge some gaps that, that we may have financially um, and, and, and work with alums who are um, keen to, to give back. Um, and again, I feel very strongly that, that how people can give back is not just with, with their treasures, but also with their time and their talent. So I don't, I don't uh, want to put pressure on folks for that, but, but certainly if you have an inclination to, um, to, to do any of that, please reach out to us. Um, you can see there, uh, if you want to go directly to the foundation, Sarishni's contact details are there, but please feel free to reach out to any of us in IP, and we would love to connect you with, with the right folks, either at the Career Center or alumni or, or the foundation or with our colleagues abroad who would love to, to, to see you as, as the world opens up to travel again, hopefully touch wood very soon. So thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand it back over to Hannah. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, and so now we are going to um, open it up to some questions. I will note, we are definitely over the hour time frame that we had initially promised. So if you have other plans, if you have other places to be, you are more than welcome to leave whenever you need to. Um, but we are going to turn it back over to Dr. Allen and maybe Frank, if folks have any questions for our friends in Florence, um, we'll let them kind of answer questions as long as they want. Keep in mind the time difference. So they are definitely a little bit later in the evening than we are, uh, but we will turn it over to some questions. We can um, absolutely use the chat if you want to type in your questions and we can have them read the questions and answer them that way. I am also going to allow you all to unmute yourself. If you would like to ask a question out loud verbally, you are welcome to do that as well. We'll just uh, try to manage it as best we can. Um, so I will turn it over for questions. I will also add, sorry, quickly, um, we've gotten a lot of questions about the recording for this event. The recording will be available. We have recorded it so that we could share it later. Um, it will be available on our YouTube channel and I'm sure that Frank will post it to the Florence Facebook. We will be sharing it on social media as soon as that recording is available. Um, so thank you to everyone who's asking and who wants to be able to rewatch it and share it with folks later. Um, I, I heard that there were several mud angels that were uh, listening uh, this evening. Um, number one, a, a, a hearty hello from, from Florence. And uh, when you do get back to um, uh, Florence, uh, it'd be uh, a, a pleasure to, uh, uh, well, I, I'll take you in front of the Mud Angel Monument that um, uh, I've just completed also in December in your honor. Um, so it'd be a pleasure to meet and talk with all of you um, in, the, in the Florence Center and also in front of the monument dedicated to you. Um, so thank you for all of your dedication uh, early on in that extremely difficult time period in um, uh, 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 1966. So a special hello to all of you. If there's any questions whatsoever, um, uh, you can even write me through um, uh, my FSU uh, email, um, but I'm, I'm here if anyone wants to shout, um, shout them out, I'd be ha more than happy to, 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 um, to, to answer anything. I just wanna say something because I see him on uh, Zoom and that's Dr. Ken Thigpen, who is also one of our mud angels from 1966. 
uh, we're so fortunate to have him back here this summer. But instead of a student, these 55 years later, as a member of our faculty. And he will be teaching not only a classical mythology course, but also a course on our mud angels, which basically deals with the legend and the folklore and the reality of these groups of students, not just, of course, Florida State students, but also the all the international students that helped out uh, in the aftermath of the flood something that we've been trying to channel to our current group of students uh, as well. And they've taken that example uh, much to heart. So I see him there and I just wanted to give him a shout out. Uh, we're so happy that he's gonna join us. And part of that class is actually to collect an audio archive uh, of our angels to preserve those memories uh, for posterity. So we're excited also to welcome a special alumnus back to the study center all these years later to enthrall and inspire our current students. Okay, okay. well, um, I wanna thank all of you for, for coming out tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. I uh, hope to see you back in Florence. Um, Frank, thanks again. Charles, okay. A lot, thanks of, again. People, <laughs> a lot of uh, people don't know this, but we worked together at the British Institute. How many years ago? Oh, when I had 10, hair, 11, yeah. 12. Yeah, yeah, there. <laughs> and uh, that's how we became colleagues and eventually friends. And, you know, we had to get his skill uh, in his special way with the students here to uh, Florida State. So thank you, everybody. And hopefully we see everybody in these uh, halls at our uh, alma mater here in Florence very, very soon when this, when this is pandemic is over. Ciao, Rigsby. Thanks. Thanks again.